in my opinion, a period where, we, where industry and, and the Defense Department and the scientific community all worked very, very closely together. It was a golden period in terms of getting things done and, and pushing technology forward at a, ra a rapid rate. And there was also the excitement knowing that, you know, we had a goal and here was a moon that had been out there since uh, humankind had first recorded history to see it. And a few of us were going to get the opportunity to go out there and fly to it and see it and be there. But also, how would we get there? That was the excitement. The Titan program was really the key to our ability to do our job during the Cold War. This country needed to have the ability to understand what weapon systems the Soviet Union was really developing. If I go back to our experience on Viking, um, we had confidence the launch vehicle would be there, and it was. Uh, and it was ready to go. Uh, it did its job, and it performed flawlessly, and it was the foundation upon which Viking was built. It is an absolute essential partner for Department of Defense in terms of not only just the space program, but the contribution of the space program to our warfighting forces. And you can almost put this, the Titan IV, as the number one priority for launching very, very critical systems in support of our national security. With the Titan IV-B configuration, we will have improved reliability, but more importantly, we'll have a 25% increase in our payload capability allowing us to put 47,000 pounds in low Earth orbit and up to 12,000 pounds up to geosynchronous. Tremendous improvement for the American public. Those were the golden years of, of uh working together and getting decisions made promptly and uh, letting the people out in the field do the job. If, uh, my philosophy was, well, if we don't get the job done, they can fire us and they'll fire us. I, I, I considered myself as a football coach. If I lost too many ball games, I was going to get fired, period. We wanted the competition, so we, we opted for a two-stage system in addition to the Atlas. and. Uh, that, was, that responsibility was given to the Western Development Division, which I commanded. The Development Planning Office was an office that had the responsibility of looking at the long term. In other words, what would technology provide from an operational standpoint 10, 15 years in the future? And our job was to prepare development planning objectives, which were, went directly to the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. First, the military, that is the Air Force and Defense Department, gave the ICBM program the highest national priority as far as the Defense Department was concerned. President Eisenhower in 1956 gave the ICBM program, as well as the other, the all, all ballistic missile programs, the highest national priority. So the political climate was favorable, and that was also true in the Congress. Congress was highly supportive of our ballistic missile programs during, that, during the period that I was in charge of it from 1954 to 59. We needed to deter an attack against the United States. And the ICBM at that particular point in time was considered as the ultimate weapon. The deterrent value of the, particularly the ICBM because they were 5,500 miles from their target, and yet could be deposited on their target in 35 minutes, 30 to 35 minutes. Uh, I didn't think we'd ever, ever use ballistic missiles. I think where we have a reasonable degree of rationality in the government, and I think there was that in the Soviet Union, uh, that will not happen. Uh, we had some failures at one point, in the Titan program before we, before we had our first successful launch. I never lost uh, confidence and neither did, neither did the team that was working the program. Uh, we were always disappointed and knew we'd have to 
answer to somebody, someone when we had failures, but we kept on going. And, and uh, we had, we of course took a look, a very close look and analyzed as best we could what caused the failure. We wouldn't just go out there and launch another missile the next day. But uh, we, we were, we were, we never lost, uh, lost confidence with respect to being able to get the job done. The Titan has proven to be a, a very, very uh, uh, useful, not only from a military uh, offensive standpoint, but also from a space standpoint and all that space has provided. And the importance of that is readily seen from what happened in the Iraqi war. to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The Gemini Man spaceflight program was a unique step between the initial steps into space on Mercury and then to meet the commitment of going to the moon the President Kennedy had laid out of Apollo. But to go to the moon in the method we had, the architecture, we had to rendezvous, we had to have precise reentry back on the Earth, we had to spend long durations of time. And while we were starting to design Apollo hardware, nobody had ever done a rendezvous. Nobody had spent a long duration mission or even a precise re-entry. So it was decided that we would take an interim step and then apply the lessons we would learn from this interim step into Apollo. The Titan what was uh, the booster we had available, you know, to look at a payload of around 8,000 pounds into low Earth orbit and to modify the Titan II ballistic missile. It had the reliability and had the payload. There was just a unique uh, availability of what this launch vehicle had. Now, of course, it was two-staged. To give you an example of the difference in the feel of riding that thing, the big Saturn that I flew out to the moon on Apollo 10 was 12 minutes into orbit. You know, four and a half G, pulse, three and three quarters, a small kick. And then the small Saturn flew on a 1B and flew on Apollo Soyuz was 10 minutes, two stages, four and a half and three and a quarters. The shuttle, piece of cake. The liquid engines fall back. It's eight and a half minutes positive, but it's only about three Gs. In the Gemini Titan, you were in orbit in five minutes and 35 seconds. And particularly the staging sequence in that second stage burnout was a real kick that you will never forget. And of course, designed as a ballistic missile in the sequence, when the first stage shut down, you're riding and you're pushed back in there about five and a half Gs and suddenly it shuts down. And they go through a sequence they still use today called fire in the hole, where they fire the second stage before the bolts explode. So you're sitting there and wham, you go from five and a half Gs down to zero G. There's a big flash of fire, you fly through the fire and you're gone. <laughs> and even though the, some of the staging sequence on Apollo was unique, that fire in the hole in Gemini was, was really unbelievable. And then as you kept going on the second stage, you couldn't hardly hear the engines run. You knew something was going back there with that single thrust chamber, and just this force kept pulling up more and more and more. And finally, you got up near eight Gs pushing on you. You'd get a few little stomach pains, but you'd be hanging on there, and suddenly, in a tenth of a second, you went from nearly eight Gs to zero G, just whop. So you picked up, oh golly, 1,500 miles an hour in the last 10 seconds on that Titan. It was a kick. But also, we had to get off of it very fast because we were concerned about some auto ignition in the gas generators back on the second stage. So within 20 seconds from the time that engine shut down, taking you from eight Gs to zero G, you pushed the separation button and the maneuver handle and you got off of it. It was really a sporty ride. To have the reliability for a manned system, it takes a whole series of improvements over what you would have just as far as reliability numbers for a simple ballistic missile. And so there was a series of uh, redundant hydraulic systems that were put into the Titan II, the electrical systems, the sequence systems, and it was called man rating the booster. And in that, we had uh, astronauts assigned to various systems to look at it, to make inputs, to coordinate with engineers. So we were deeply involved uh, throughout the whole process of doing it. So it was a very, a very wonderful feeling to be involved in seeing the engineering inputs there and the, the final end results. 
You know, you talk about togetherness. The Gemini was so small. You have less room in Gemini than you had in the front seat of a bug Volkswagen. In fact, I couldn't put my feet together in the footwell. Well, you know, for, the, for, for such a, a small spacecraft, and what we performed was unbelievable in that period of time in the, the two years from the, the starting, I think, March of 65 and through the end of 66 when we did those 10 manned Gemini missions. We had two unmanned previously before that. And it was really amazing what we accomplished with that little spacecraft. We couldn't possibly afford to protect the country against all potential uh, or technically possible weapon systems. So we needed to have an understanding of what the Soviets were really developing and what their true capabilities were. The only way one can really do that is to look at and monitor their test ranges almost on a continuing basis. And prior to the Titan, we could only keep low orbiting, low Earth orbiting satellites on orbit for a matter of days or at best a couple of weeks. And that was brought about by the limited amount of, of weight that we could put on orbit and the propellant necessary to maintain a low Earth orbit. With the Titan, we increased that to months to years. And so we were able to essentially keep satellites on orbit on a continuing basis to monitor the activities uh, that were taking place in the Soviet Union. The Titan 3C probably placed about 80% of the military satellites in geosynchronous orbit. Uh, probably closer to 50% of all satellites, including commercial and civil, uh, into geosynchronous orbit. If you include low Earth orbit, uh, which was most of ours, uh, the number would be a lot greater than that. We alone put up about 177 satellites. Now that was with all versions of the Titan, not just the sea. The bringing together of Martin and of our spacecraft contractors and the government team in a team effort working toward the successful mission accomplishment and the mission being a satellite successfully on orbit uh, really evolved into a very successful program uh, and the teamwork associated with that was critical to that achievement. Well, Viking was a, uh, an extraordinary mission in the mid-1970s, and I might also say it would be an extraordinary mission today. When you're doing a program such as, uh, such as Viking, or in the future, a program such as Cassini, uh, one of the very important things is you have to be confident that, uh, that all parts of the program are going to do their job uh, with excellence. Um, that's uh, particularly important, obviously, the launch vehicle uh, part of the program. You have to be confident that the launch vehicle, one, has the capability to do the job. That was never an issue with, uh, with the Titan III. We knew the vehicle had the capability. Uh, the second is you have to be confident that uh, the launch vehicle is going to work. Um, that also um, you know, was not an issue because of the extraordinary success record that the Titan program had had. had. And that will also be the circumstance when Cassini is launched. I mean, there will be enormous confidence in, uh, in the capabilities and in the reliability of the launch vehicle. Uh, the third thing is uh, you have to be confident that the, uh, that the systems all show up uh, on time because you have a very uh, narrow window at which you can go to these planets and, uh, and everybody has to really be ready on day one so that you don't lose a valuable resource which could be one day of, uh, of the launch vehicle. Uh, from the space aspects, I think that Viking uh, probably, uh, well I know that Viking was instrumental in actually putting Mark Marietta in the, uh, in the space business. They were heavily involved in the launch vehicle business. Um, but the space business, which has become so much a part of the corporation, Viking played a role in, um, in, in helping Mark Marietta become a number one player in that level of business. So Viking, as I said, and programs like this, they, uh, they, they are a lot of things to a lot of people. And while Viking enormously enhanced 
what we know about the planet Mars and enormously enhance our knowledge of our, uh, of our overall solar system. It did an awful lot of other things also. It's really extraordinary for an individual, for a corporation, and for a country to be able to uh, muster the resources to do something such as Viking in a, in a successful fashion. It's kind of like uh, um, approaching Mission Impossible and doing it. Right after uh, the program got started, actually the Titan IV, at that time we were, had changed the name, uh, we were getting, getting ready to change the name. The program was approved by Congress actually in 1985. We got the first increment of money, about $35 million, to begin the program in 1985. Uh, we had a program laid out for a uh, limited buy of 10 vehicles tried to get as close to commercial practices as we could with that such a limited buy, but we got the program started. And of course, first failure, D7, occurred in August of 85, then the Challenger failure in January of 86, and then the second Titan in a row failed in April of 1986. It was a very black time for the space program. It so happened we also had an Ariane failure about that time and a Delta failure and shortly thereafter an Atlas failure. So it was a, a very particularly uh, gloomy period for uh, getting you know, what I, we would then call assured access to space. But as we saw the time at which shuttle was going to return to flight getting longer and longer from an estimate of a year or so to eventually it got to a three year delay time. The further it got delayed, the more we had to go and pick up the manifest by using ELVs. And so Titan grew immediately uh, up to about 48 vehicles. We had to institute a new program for launching GPS satellites that became Delta II. We had, as, as the delay got further up toward the three years, we had to institute a new program called the MLV-2, which became Atlas Centaur. All those programs had to start in a very rapid uh, sequence uh, right after Challenger because we, we, we had to have payloads. These were operational satellites that had to have launch vehicles. And so not only did we expand the Titan program, which uh, was absolutely necessary for launching some of the larger DOD payloads, but we also had to establish uh, the other lighter weight launch vehicles for launching other payloads. And what we basically did is we reestablish the commercial launch industry for the United States. It was a necessity uh, stimulated by the Department of Defense, but in fact, uh, uh, it was necessary to do so. And uh, I think the industry has benefited from that as well as the, as the country. We couldn't do our job without the Titan IV. Absolutely essential. The payloads that it launches are the most critical in the nation. If you think about satellites, uh, some of the communication satellites we have, certainly the navigation satellites, uh, they tend to behave, be multiple numbers. Uh, if we lose one or one fails on orbit, uh, the mission is not, uh, does not fail. In the case of the payloads we launch on Titan, any one of those is critical to mission success. Every one of those payloads usually contributes to a mission and therefore uh, it, it, they are extremely critical to carrying out the, uh, the requirements of the Department of Defense. As the nation's primary heavy lift vehicle, we launched the important satellites, I believe the most important satellites in the inventory, to include interplanetary missions, such as the mission to the planet Saturn called Cassini from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. In addition, we launched the Defense Support Program, which provides early missile warning and attack warning to our warfighters in the field. We launched the Milstar program, for example, which has jam-proof communications so our men can talk anywhere, anyplace, anytime without fear of having their communications cut off. And we launched the very important national security payload. We will clearly be flying Titans out through the year 2000. Uh, we right now have a production contract that takes us through 1999. In addition, the Air Force is considering buying six more of the vehicles. that have been very successful for us with a 95% success rate. We're very happy with that. The new vehicles will all be Titan 4B configurations, which have operational improvements and performance improvements for the American public.
The U.S. ballistic missile program was a complete success. And I'm talking not only about the Titan and, and the Air Force, I'm talking about the Army and the Navy. And there's no question in my mind that we, uh, we had a superior ICBM capability to the Russians, to the Soviets. And that in itself uh, provided the deterrent uh, when uh, we backed Khrushchev down in the Cuban Missile Crisis. I think that's a very good uh, demonstration of, of uh, our capabilities. And he, he knew that, that uh, we meant it uh, during that crisis, and he backed off. Well, I just thank God that I had the opportunity to participate in the four missions I did in space, in particular the two Titan Geminis, in which each step we did was one that had never been done before. And the first rendezvous in space that we did with Gemini 6 proved out the theory, proved up the backup techniques. Then on Gemini 9, proved the three different types of rendezvous. Well, certainly from our perspective, the Titan was the workhorse of the launch systems. Uh, I have not added up the weight but my guess is that uh, we must have put up close to a million pounds of uh, spacecraft into orbit over the years. Uh, virtually all of that was put up by the Titan program. Uh, it was critical to our mission, and our being able to accomplish our mission. The success rate of the Titan, to us at least, has been outstanding and, uh, and essential to our mission. One of the exciting things about doing something like biking is you learn a lot, uh, but your curiosity becomes even stronger to, uh, to go back again. And Mars is a planet we need to visit uh, uh, extensively, uh, maybe bring a sample back uh, to Earth, because someday people will, uh, will find going to Mars a, a very convenient kind of a thing to do. There was always a threat to our national security. While we may not have the threat from the Soviet Union, there are threats all over the world. If we have to go protect our interests, we're going all over the world, not to just one location. So global awareness, global communications, uh, this collection of global information, passing that information back, being able to communicate with our forces globally, is an essential part of maintaining our national security, irrespective of the fact that the one of the main superpower threats has gone away. There are other lesser but equally threatening threats which use very high technology that could threaten our interest around the world. We're the heavy lift vehicle, the premier largest lift system in the United States inventory. 